thank you very much. What a nice introduction. This is my second visit to Hillsdale. When I was here last summer, uh, somebody introduced me, and he said that he didn't want to take very long introducing me, first because he didn't want to use up all my time, and second because he wanted to be sure not to make any mistakes. And so if he just said one sentence, he couldn't possibly say anything wrong. So he got up and he said, our speaker made a million dollars in the gold market in London. Here's Harry Brown. And I, I stood up to this thunderous ovation. And when it quieted down, I said, gee, I really do appreciate that. That was so nice and so short and to the point. But since you were worried about accuracy, I guess I should point out that it wasn't the gold market. It was the silver market. And it wasn't London. It was Zurich. And, you know, it really wasn't a million dollars. It was more like, oh, 100,000 or so. And it wasn't me. It was my brother. <laughs> and he didn't make it. He lost it. <laughs> so thank you very much, Richard. I do appreciate that. Government doesn't work, as we've all figured out by now. It can't deliver the mail on time. It doesn't educate our children properly. It doesn't keep the city safe. Uh, and yet this gigantic game of let's pretend goes on. Let's pretend the war on poverty really does help poor people. Let's pretend the war on drugs really does something about drugs in America and reduces crime and so on. Government has failed at practically everything that it does. But it is good at one thing. And that one thing is that it knows how to cripple you, break your legs, and then hand you a crutch and say, see, if it weren't for the government, you wouldn't be able to walk. And it has created a situation whereby it has destroyed the medical industry, uh, destroyed health care in America through Medicare and Medicaid, and then comes along and says, see, if it weren't for the government, you wouldn't be able to get uh, medical care. You'd probably be dying in the streets. It has created a situation where people have become dependent upon the government because of problems that the government itself has created. But even more, so, it has polished and perfected the knack of being able to blame other people for the sins of government. As government has destroyed the health care system, who have we gotten mad at? The health insurance companies uh, take the brunt of the criticism, not the government. In the 1970s, we had rampant inflation in America, but who got the blame? The Arab oil sheiks and the labor unions and businessmen who were greedy and so on. No one blamed the government's loose monetary policy, which had been going on for 10 years and had made inflation inevitable. And government always finds a scapegoat, somebody to blame, so that we never turn to government and face the fact that government doesn't work and that what we need to do is to reduce government's involvement in our lives. And nowhere can we see this, I think, more clearly than with the question of the law today and the feeling that we have about the law and how it has been perverted by lawyers. Lawyers take the brunt of all the problems, all the lawyer jokes that exist, uh, uh, all the criticisms of lawyers as sharks and predators and so forth. And yet the problem today, there is no more a problem of lawyers that, than medical care is a problem of health insurance companies. It is a problem of government. The government has created a situation in which the proliferation of lawyers and the aggressiveness of lawyers is the obvious logical conclusion. And I think that the title of the seminar this week of Power and Liberty, uh, the sense of this uh, conflict between the two, is a very, very important and appropriate title. Because one of the consequences of our feeling towards the law and lawyers these days is that we have come to believe that we don't have enough government, that that's why we have so much crime in this country, that we need government solutions to many things. Conservatives, for instance, say that we need tort reform. What does tort reform mean? It means that we need the government to impose laws that say the people can't get more than, than X amount of dollars if they win a lawsuit. Well, it's the government that's created these lawsuits in the first place. Why would we turn to government to try to solve the problem? Why would we think that adding one more law on top of all the laws that have created this problem is somehow going to solve it? And then on the other hand, we have the problem of crime in America. And there is an obvious solution to all of this. What we need are tougher sentences, more prisons, higher taxes to, to hire more policemen, uh, mandatory sentences. We need to get tough on criminals. We need to suspend the Bill of Rights in some cases in order to be able to put these people behind bars and so forth. Once again, government has created a tremendous problem and government comes riding to the rescue like the cavalry and says, if you'll just give up more of your liberty and give more power to the government, we can make this work. When in fact, it is government that threw the monkey wrench in the works in the first place. So let's look at some of these things in a little bit more detail and see how we have gotten ourselves into this position and how we might be able to extricate ourselves. First of all, with regard to the lawsuits. The lawsuits proliferate today because government has created so many laws that lay the basis for lawsuits. Uh, there's a principle at work here that may serve us in good stead in many cases. Whenever you see a widespread proliferation of one thing that suddenly comes out of nowhere, you have to ask yourself, why is that happening now when it didn't happen before? And let's, let's take an off the subject uh, example here for a change. People say American companies are greedy and they're moving offshore in order to get the profits that would come from low-wage workers in Indonesia and Thailand and places like this. And suddenly all these companies are moving offshore. And at the same time here in America, companies are laying off people at a rate that they never did before during a time when we're not in a depression or a recession. And they say, well, why is this happening? Well, because companies are greedy and they're trying to maximize their profits. But you have to ask yourself, why now? 
Companies have always tried to maximize their profits. Companies have always tried to lower their costs in whatever way they could and to uh, increase their income in order to maximize profits for their shareholders. Why now? Why didn't they do this in the 1950s and the 1960s? In the 1950s, you could go to Thailand and get workers for 10 cents an hour or Indonesia or some other country. And that in those days, you could go to Korea or Taiwan and get workers for 10 cents an hour. But they didn't do it. Why is it happening now? When suddenly everybody in an industry seems to be moving in one direction that they weren't moving before, you have to ask yourself, what has changed? Why is it that the normal forces of supply and demand don't compensate for things as they usually, usually do to restore an equilibrium again? The only way this can happen is, that when, is when government steps in and through force creates a situation that nobody can compensate for. And in the case of the companies moving offshore, what has happened obviously is that we have finally reached the point in America where regulations are so oppressive and taxes are so high on American companies that they have no choice but to move offshore. They could always do it before, but they didn't. Why? Because low-cost labor is not the be-all and end-all of business. Productivity is the be-all and end-all of business. Productivity at a profit. And that was not in the offing before by moving offshore. But now they have no choice. Now they have no choice but to lay off workers en masse and try to contract with um, uh, independent companies who are not subject to some of the regulations that big companies are. All of these various regulations that have been piled on one by one by one over the years, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Civil Rights Act, uh, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, everyone with a high-sounding purpose, everyone to accomplish some great social good, each one has added another straw on the back of the camel until it has reached the point where American business, in many cases, can no longer survive by staying on shore. And in the same way, each one of these laws has also brought with it the ability to sue somebody else. The Americans uh, with Disabilities Act, for instance, contains all sorts of provisions in it by which private individuals can sue other private individuals. Every environmental law that's passed in this country includes a provision by which private individuals can sue other private individuals. I'll give you a good example. The EPA just recently proposed a new set of regulations by which every company that produces anything in this country that might under any circumstances, uh, in any conceivable case, pollute the atmosphere must first, before it changes its production procedures, submit a plan to the EPA to be approved to make absolutely sure that this new method of production, this new change in its production scheme, will not in some way lead to pollution. Now this means that a company like Intel, which is the world's greatest manufacturer of semiconductor chips and is, the, uh, is an American company in California and leads the world in this area, now every time it makes a change in its production practices, which happens once or twice a week, will have to submit it to the EPA. Uh, let the EPA sit on it for 60 days, then have public hearings when people can come and testify and say, we don't think you should allow uh, Intel to do this because uh, this may pollute the atmosphere here or it may cause drainage here or it may do this or that, uh, and let the public comment on it for about 60 days. And then finally, maybe the, the plan will be approved, but by, of course by this time its competitors in Japan and other places will have gotten the jump on them and moved well ahead. But also involved in this, is a provision whereby any company can sue Intel, even if the EPA approves the plan, but any, pardon me, any private organization or individual can sue Intel if it believes that it is polluting the atmosphere in this new production process. Now what this leads to is a fundraising scheme for private organizations. You just simply go to a company like Intel and say, we're going to sue you because we don't think your plan is right. And the result of that is that Intel has no choice but to settle out of court rather than let the, the change in production be held up. Lawyers are at work here, of course, but it is not the lawyer that is the problem. It is the law that has created this opportunity to blackmail companies. In the same way, Texaco recently settled for $175 million, a proposed suit against it for racial discrimination. Uh, by the time the whole, all the facts had come out, it was obvious that there was no racial discrimination involved at Texaco, that nothing had happened. But organizations came forward on behalf of supposed aggrieved individuals at Texaco and planned this lawsuit. And uh, they probably would have had Texaco tied up in the courts for years, so Texaco simply settled it for $175 million. Now, lawyers were at work here. And in fact, lawyers were very aggressive about it. And lawyers were, were taking advantage of every opportunity that had been given to them by the government to be able to make this happen. So we can say that lawyers perhaps are uh, preying on the rest of us. But are they preying on us any more than, say, college students who accept Pell Grants and, and uh, uh, student loans from the government? Are they preying on us any more than farmers who accept farm subsidies from the government or Archer Daniels Midland who accepts an ethanol subsidy or anybody else who takes money for the government or takes advantage of a special privilege, maybe one it lobbied for before Congress? The point is lawyers are no different from anyone else in the country. It is the laws that have created the problem, not the lawyers. And if we reduce the laws, if we take all this tangle of regulations out, then we will no longer have a litigious society as we have had develop over the last 30 years. The same thing is true in the area of crime. Today, uh, crime is on a scale that people of my age just could not fathom, uh, could not imagine 40, 50 years ago. I grew up in a suburb of Los Angeles. 
On Friday night, I, when I was 10 or 12 years old, I used to walk to the movie theater a mile away and uh, see a movie, and at 10 o'clock at night, I would walk home about a mile to, to where we lived. I had no fear whatsoever of muggers. There were no drug dealers on the street. Uh, there were no addicts. There were no homeless people. There were no gangs fighting over monopoly territories. None of these things existed. I couldn't imagine living in a world like that, and yet that is the world we live in today. And crime has reached such a scale that people who believe in the Bill of Rights, people who believe in theory, in liberty and freedom and individual rights and so forth are willing to sacrifice those things now if that's what's necessary to do something about crime. But the problem again, uh, we have to look at it from the standpoint of what has caused this vast change. Uh, there must be something that has happened that has caused this. It isn't that suddenly people have become worse, uh, that people have suddenly uh, uh, developed bad hearts, uh, cold hearts, evil hearts, uh, evil souls over the last 40 years. It isn't that morality has dwindled because morality is something that lives inside of people and it doesn't dwindle under any circumstances. People can live in the worst conditions uh, and they don't change their morality. Something must have changed. And again, we have to look to the government to find out what it is. Forty, fifty years ago, we didn't have police forces and courts and uh, governments that were so concerned about victimless crimes. What is a victimless crime? A victimless crime, by definition, is one in which no victim makes a complaint. Now, a victimless crime might be prostitution, drugs, um, gambling, anything where an individual is doing something that the law has said is wrong, but where he is not trespassing on some other human being, where he is not assaulting or threatening some other human being, where he is not taking property from someone or damaging somebody else's property, but is simply doing something that all participants agree to. So as a matter of fact, there is no victim. Uh, now, somebody may report one of these crimes to the police, but that person is not a victim making a complaint. He is an informer who is informing about the crime to the police, right or wrong, he is an informer, not a victim. Now, 40 or 50 years ago, we had laws against prostitution, we had laws against drugs, we had laws against um, gambling and all these other things, but they were enforced mainly in the breach. The drug laws in particular were not enforced very strongly at all. The first drug law we even had in this country was in 1914, the Harrison Act. Before 1914, a 10-year-old child could walk into a drugstore and buy heroin. Can you imagine that? A 10-year-old child could walk into a drugstore and buy heroin without a doctor's prescription, without a note from her parents, without anything. Just walk in, buy it off the shelf. You didn't even have to see the druggist. Uh, you just take it off the shelf. It was sold in packaged form as a pain reliever and a sedative, just the way Bayer sells aspirin today. And yet, despite this unrestricted availability of drugs, of heroin, of some other drugs that uh, were uh, somewhat popular at the time, there was no drug problem in America. 10-year-old children didn't take drugs because the only reason they would ever come to the drugstore and buy it if they did was to take it home to their parents because their parents sent them down to the drugstore to get it the way they might send them down to get a cold uh, remedy today or something like it. There were no drug dealers on the streets peddling drugs. There were no gangs fighting over monopoly territories. There were no muggers trying to support $100 a day habits. None of these things existed. Even after the drug laws were passed, the first one in 1914 and then marijuana outlawed in 1938 and so on, the laws were not enforced and there were no drug problems. But along about 1960, the federal government declared war on drugs. And then we had a drug problem in America. And once the war on drugs started, drugs became harder to get, and they became a criminal enterprise. And the only people who could provide drugs then well, were hardened criminals who were willing to flout the law and willing to face the, the punishment that might come if they get caught. Uh, and we've then experienced the second bout of prohibition in America. The first bout being that during the 1920s when alcohol was illegal and we had gangs fighting over monopoly territories and uh, killings on the street, drive-by shootings, all the things that we take for granted today existed in the 1920s. When prohibition was repealed in 1933, the crime rate in America peaked after rising for 15 years and steadily fell year by year by year for 30 years. Both the total crime rate and the homicide rate dropped year after year after year until the war on drugs started at the beginning of the 1960s. And then it turned around and went in the other direction until by the 1970s we were already in the situation that we take for granted today and think will always be with us forever. Now, here again, we have this situation where government has created this gigantic drug enterprise in America, created a problem where now People have an incentive to inflict drugs on children and get them hooked on drugs, where people have an incentive to push drugs in your face and try to make you take them because then you become a $100 a day customer for then on perhaps for the rest of your short life that will uh, remain after that. And now we have this problem created by government. So what is the solution that we hear? Well, Newt Gingrich thinks we ought to execute all the drug dealers. Uh, other people say what we need is to uh, get rid of the exclusionary laws that uh, make evidence tainted if it's illegally obtained so that it, uh, then the evidence can't be used in court. Uh, other people think we need mandatory sentences. Other people think we need to build more prisons, uh, and on and on and on. All the answers are more and more government, more and more compulsion to solve the problems that compulsion has created. 
obviously this isn't the answer. What we have today is a situation in which murderers, muggers, child molesters, rapists get out of prison early on, early release, or they never go to prison in the first place on a plea bargaining because there isn't enough space in the prisons. Why? Because there are marijuana smokers sitting in the jails, uh, because there are people who have never committed violence against other people sitting in those prisons, because there are people who are no threat to anyone filling up the prison cells. Now, I'm not saying that all the people in prison today are nonviolent. Obviously not. But the point is that 100,000 people convicted of child molesting have been released from prison early over the last couple of years because of prison overcrowding. And at the same time, more than 100,000 people are sitting in prison today who have never committed a crime of violence against anyone, who have never stolen anyone's property, who have never aggressed against anyone, who have never threatened anyone, who have never committed a crime for which there is a victim, only a crime against the state. So once again, we see this situation where government creates a problem, points to the solution being more government, and we turn to it as being the only answer. We don't need mandatory minimum sentences. We don't need more prisons. What we need to do is to focus the law back on law enforcement to the protection of property and the protection of individuals. Now, this is the key point, of course, that uh, Frederick Bastiat, the French parliamentarian of the 19th century, pointed out the difference in two different kinds of laws. Uh, is the law designed to protect life and property? If so, then it is a good law in his view. Is the law designed either to take from one person and give to another or to simply enforce one person's will upon the other, which is what the drug laws and, and the other uh, victimless crime laws are? Uh, then that is a bad law. And what happens when you create laws of this kind, laws that give rise to civil suits, laws that give rise to victimless crime people being put in jail, the law becomes perverted. And it becomes perverted in two ways. The first way is that all the resources that should be going into protecting us, protecting our life and property, so a child of 10 or 12 years old could walk through that suburb of Los Angeles on a Friday night to and from the theater, as I did in the 1940s. All those resources are being devoted to vice and other questions where people are not being hurt, and, it's th and all those resources are being consumed and they're not available elsewhere. Uh, but secondly, the respect for the law itself becomes so diminished as a result of this that people begin to use the law then as a vehicle for getting what they want through lawsuits, uh, through getting subsidies, through getting all of these other things, and it becomes a free-for-all, and the law has no meaning whatsoever anymore. The law is no longer the impartial guardian of our liberty, the impartial guardian of our life and our property, but now the law has become simply an instrument by which one person forces his way upon another. And that is what we have come to today. That is why we have a trillion and a half dollar government and a five trillion dollar debt. That is why we have courts that are clogged up with lawsuits uh, over nothing. That's why we have lawsuits that make people instantly rich because they didn't follow the directions on a can that they uh, ordered at the store, whether it's a can of paint or whether they tried to uh, do some foolish thing with a ladder that it was never meant to do or whatever it may be, they can become instantly rich using the law as their weapon. Uh, that is not what the law is for. The law is there to protect our life and our property and that is it. Now. Once the law reaches this point, it seems to be uh, a self-accelerating process whereby year by year by year it gets worse and everybody's got his hand in the till and so nobody wants to take his hand out first and it seems impossible that we will ever be able to do anything about it. And we have reached the point today where people despair that this will ever change or that it will ever be reversed. I don't share their despair. I don't believe that we are not going to solve this. I can't tell you that we are going to solve it, that we are going to change this, that we are going to restore the law to its proper function, but I believe it is very, very possible. Did you know that 75% of the American people, by all the polls that have been taken in the last few years, think the government is too big? That 62% think that it poses an immediate danger to uh, the future of America? Uh, that when Gallup did a poll in 1994 and classified people according to their answers without using labels to the people themselves, they found that the largest group of people in this country at 30% were the conservatives, the smallest group at 12% were the liberals, and third place at 16% were the populists, meaning people who wanted more government control of, uh, of the economy and more government control of society, whereas the liberals who just wanted more government control over the economy but less government control over society, and the conservatives wanted more government control over society and less over the economy. But in second place were those that Gallup labeled as libertarian, people who wanted less government control over our social lives and less government control over our economic lives. Uh, Joseph Sobrin, uh, just off the point for a minute, uh, wrote a couple of years ago, that if you want to intrude on people's economic lives but not on their social life, you are called a liberal. If you want to intrude upon their economic, uh, on their social life but not their economic life, then you are called a conservative. If you want to intrude upon both aspects of their life, then you're called a moderate. <laughs> and if you don't want to intrude upon any part of their life, then you're called an extremist. Uh, but the fact is that the libertarian element of the population is the fastest growing element as more and more people come to realize that government doesn't work that government is not the answer, 
to the problems that government has created. And that it doesn't matter whether the good guys or the bad guys propose a law, it isn't going to work anyway. So what difference does it make? It doesn't matter whether the law is designed to do what you want it to do or what you don't want it to do, it isn't going to happen anyway. So what is the point? And more and more people are coming to realize this. What has been missing as people's consciousness has been further and further elevated over the last 20 to 30 years, slowly but surely, is the one thing that has been missing has been a political channel through which they could funnel this feeling, this anti-government sentiment. Uh, the Republican Party has seemed to be the repository of that, but of course it has provided absolutely nothing since it won Congress, just as it provided no gain whatsoever when it had the presidency. And the Libertarian Party is hardly known to most people in America. So to those people, they feel this way, but they feel a great sense of despair because they see no way that they are ever going to turn it around. And in my view, it will remain that way until there is a political force large enough that people can climb aboard and say, here is where we can make a difference, here is where we can turn it around. Now, you may feel that that means reforming the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. I feel that that force will have to be the Libertarian Party because I don't trust anybody in the other two parties to actually mean what they say. They've been saying all the good things for so many years and doing nothing when they had the chance. But whatever it is, that force is building, and we have to, to encourage it. And if we do, I think we can restore uh, the ideas of America that made it so unique, which were limited government, which uh, included an impartial law that people could count on that was there to protect your life, your liberty, and your property, but not to give you an advantage over somebody else, not to be used as an instrument of plunder, not to be used as a, a way of gaining a foothold, but rather simply to protect you so that you could go about your business. That was the American ideal. It was unique. Uh, it was the culmination of all that had come in Western Europe, but where it finally uh, arrived was a unique place in history, and we have now lost it. But I believe we can get it back. And when we do, then we will not worry about lawyers anymore, because lawyers, like everyone else, will take advantage of whatever opportunity is presented to them. And when those opportunities are no longer there, then they will go out and find an honest way to make a living like the rest of us have to. But in the meantime, we waste our energy and we waste our anger by directing it towards lawyers. What we should be directing it toward are the laws that have made today's plunderous society such a reality. And with that, I'm going to stop and let you answer, uh, let you answer questions. Uh, I'll let you ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. The government's so incompetent at so many things. Why would be effective if they stop the murder? That's a very good question, the, which was, if the government is so incompetent at uh, so many things, why would we expect it to be effective at preventing theft and murder and so on? The fact is that it doesn't prevent murder and theft and so on. Uh, we prevent theft and murder. We lock our doors at night. We do the things that are necessary. Uh, the only thing that the, the uh, law can do is to provide some form of guarantee of punishment. And a guarantee is too strong a word, an intimidation of punishment. Uh, that's all that it can provide is a sense of retribution. Uh, and it has done a very bad job of that because its resources have been diverted into so many uh, other areas, uh, the victimless crime thing that I talked about. But you're right that uh, we should not expect government to work any better there than it does anywhere else. It comes back to what I said before, that even if it's designed to do something good, it is still the government and it is still an incompetent agency. And the reason it doesn't work is, is twofold. It's really the twofold is, is two ways of looking at the same thing. One way of looking at it is to simply say that government is coercion. The only reason you ever pass a law is to force somebody to do what he doesn't want to do or forcibly prevent him from what he wants to do or force him to pay for something he doesn't want to pay for. And coercion is the least efficient means of, social, uh, of solving social problems or economic problems. And so what we want to do is to minimize coercion wherever possible. And if we can find a way to prevent theft or anything else better than through the coercive means of government, then so much the better. And maybe someday we will. Henry David Thoreau said, um, I heartily subscribe to that motto that says that government is best that governs least. And carried to its logical conclusion, that government is best that governs not at all. And when men are ready for such a government, that is the government they will have. And I believe that what he meant was not that when men are good and angels, then that's the kind of government we will have. I think what he, what he meant was that when men figure out how to uh, get by without this agency of coercion, then we will get by without it because they will have found a better way to do it. But that's way off in the distant future. The second uh, way of looking at this is to realize that everything you turn over to the government, from uh, law, plain old law enforcement uh, to education to health care to whatever it is, you are transforming what once was a scientific or medical or educational issue and turning it into a political issue, which now will be decided by Teddy Kennedy, Jesse Helms, and Newt Gingrich, uh, Bob Dole, Bill Clinton, and the rest of the boys. 
uh, and it will be decided on the basis of who has the most political influence, who has the most clout. That's how it will be decided. That's the way the law will be written. That's the way it will be enforced by the executive, and that's the way it will be adjudicated if it gets to the courts in any way. It will become a political issue to be decided by politicians on the basis of political influence. And it, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about something you think the government ought to do or something you think the government shouldn't do. It will still become a political issue. And that is not the way to settle anything. That's why the FDA kills more people every year than it, than it saves, simply because all the decisions are made politically in the final analysis. And uh, uh, if you're an FDA commissioner, for instance, and you've got some drug that you're testing and you uh, look at it, you're going to have one consultant who says, well, we've got this thing down to where we can see now that this is going to save a lot of lives. There still are some potential side effects that may surface in the future, but this is going to save thousands of lives every year. But you're going to have another advisor who says, well, you know, if even one person dies of a side effect from this drug, once we approve it, you're going to be dragged before Congress and you're going to be pilloried and you're going to be uh, castigated in the press and everything. You probably lose your job and so on. And uh, Congress will make life miserable for you if just one person dies of a side effect, no matter how many people have been saved. And so the decision will be made politically. And as a result, people have died from blood pressure medicine that was held off the market for six or seven years by the FDA. Thousands of people have died. More people died from keeping the drug propolinol off the market in six years than could possibly have been saved by the FDA in all the years of its existence. More people died from the, the absence of that one drug than have died from all the illegal drugs throughout this entire century in America because it was a political matter rather than a scientific or medical one. I'll see if I can be briefer uh, from here on. Yeah, but I won't promise. Yes. You last year, you said the only reason to outlaw murder was because 99% of the people were against it. Uh, the interviewer was rather surprised and asked you if there were no uh, absolutes, and you said that to discuss morality with a quote pretend game. Uh, and the title of your recent book also implies a certain pragmatism. And I was wondering if you believe that there is a God-given or natural right to life, liberty, and property, or if you think that it's merely a democratic uh, decision based on uh, rank value. Oh, there's a lot to that question. Uh, let's see if I can cover it all. In the first place, I hate to say the same old thing that I was misquoted, but uh, it, it really was a very unsatisfying interview. I had had a lot of experience with National Review and, and uh, know a lot of the editors there, and I had uh, hoped that somebody else was going to interview me. And the young woman who interviewed me uh, spent hours and hours with me wanting to discuss the philosophy of a free society with no government. And I kept telling her that that was not what the campaign was about. The campaign was about uh, what are we going to do to get the government off our backs now. When we get it down to a tenth or a fifteenth of its present size, then let's talk about how far we should go from there. Uh, what difference does it make? Yes, but. And we just kept coming back to these things. And, she's, and when I said the war on drugs was, uh, you know, uh, ineffective, oh, and I think the whole thing about murder came up because of uh, the question of abortion. And I said that uh, the fact of the matter is that if you're against abortion, the last agency in the world you would want to turn to for help would be the government. Because if, given the record of the government on drugs, having elevated drug use in this country and the war on poverty that's elevated poverty so many times over, if the government declares a war on abortion, then within five years, men are going to be having abortions. Uh, and uh, she said, well, if, you know, if, uh, why is that? I said, well, the people simply are not going to obey the law just as they didn't before. She said, well, then why do you have laws against murder? And I said, well, the laws against mur murder are, to a certain extent, more effective because most people believe that murder is wrong. But abortion is not that simple an issue. It is a very divisive issue, and, and there are very strong feelings about it. And there is a difference between the two. Now, the question of the, the right and wrong and, and where it comes from is something that can be debated endlessly, and that's the area of speculative philosophy. Uh, just like questions of, of how did the universe start in the first place. They're all wonderful questions to explore, but they do not affect the here and now because your idea of where rights come from and uh, what those natural rights are are your beliefs, and like your religious beliefs, they cannot be just handed to somebody else and accepted. Uh, but what people can see when it's brought to their attention is the utter incompetence of government, the difference between the post office and Federal Express, uh, the difference between uh, state-run television in Europe and private television in America, and all of these uh, tremendous contrasts. And what they can understand is that if they're willing to give up their favorite federal programs, they could be free of the income tax for the rest of their lives. These are things that require no faith. These are things that do not require abstract philosophical principles and first causes that have to be established that may take years and years to reach agreement on. These are things that people can see now, and that's where I believe that we should focus our attention. And I believe that whenever you talk to anybody about liberty and government, you must make it personal. You must bring it right down to their lives, where they are now. We are not trying to create a better world. We are not even trying to create a better America. We are trying to make your life better. We are going to free you from the income tax so that you will be able to do whatever you want with every single dollar you've earned, to keep it, to save it, to give it away, to do whatever you want with it, uh, but not let the government uh, confiscate it and choose for you. We're going to free you from Social Security so that instead of having 15% of your income plundered for your entire working life, and by the time you retire, it'll be 25 or 30 or 35%, instead you could put 5% away in a mutual fund or someplace and uh, be far better off by the time you're 65 years old. We're going to make your neighborhood safe by getting rid of this insane war on drugs that has caused uh, so much strife in the... the uh, 
disharmony in our society. We are going to do these things which are going to affect your life, and this is what people will respond to. And that was the point I was trying to make to her, but evidently it didn't get through. Yes, sir? Do you feel it's ever the responsibility of the government to prevent real crime? Um, to, to prevent, prevent real crime? crime? You mean in advance? Right. So like drunk driving. Do we have to wait until the drunk driver kills somebody or destroys property before we can prosecute him? I believe so, yes, uh, because I think that once you hand the government the right to act in advance, uh, there, like so many other things, there's no stopping it. There's no place where you can draw a clear line. It will then be the judgment of individuals, and you can set rules to apply to that, but those rules uh, will never be so objective and clear-cut that people can respond to them. On the other hand, if you make punishment for real crimes, swift and certain, uh, then you are going to do far more uh, than is being done now, and you won't feel the necessity. Uh, to act in advance and, and to try to preempt crime be, crimes before it happens because people will be more afraid of uh, climbing into their car when they've had too much to drink. Also, if the government ever just backed out of this field uh, and if it ever uh, got off the backs of the automakers and, and other manufacturers in this country, there might be a tremendous amount of innovation that can do so much in these fields, uh, like uh, the things that are starting to come on the market now where if you climb in your car when, you're, when you've had too much to drink, uh, your ignition won't turn, and things of this sort that are possible. Yes? I'd like not to pay income taxes for the rest of my life, but granted that we need some minimum size of government, how would you propose to raise money for it? The question is, uh, how would I propose to raise money for a government uh, without an income tax? Well, before 1913, all of the revenues of the government came from tariffs and the sale of, uh, of Western lands. Uh, we don't have any Western lands to sell anymore, uh, but uh, the amount from tariffs and excise taxes that are being collected today would be enough to finance the constitutional functions of government of national defense uh, and uh, the judiciary and the few other functions the Constitution assigns to the federal government. But one sticky problem is getting rid of the interest expense that has been piled up from all the failed programs of the past. My proposal, which I laid out in uh, the book, Why Government Doesn't Work, is that we get all of these assets of the federal government that the government shouldn't be owning in the first place, the power companies, pipelines, uh, the 42% uh, of the land in the 13 western states, uh, the uh, um, oil rights, mineral rights, these unused military bases like the Presidio that could bring a billion dollars uh, easily, several billion dollars probably, uh, the hundreds of thousands of buildings that the government owns uh, for functions that are not constitutional anyway. Put all of these on the market over a six-year period, and six years is way too long, but you don't want to depress the market. And with the first proceeds that come in by private lifetime annuities for everyone who is dependent on Social Security today and then liquidate the system immediately, not over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but liquidate it immediately. The people who are dependent on it will finally have a firm contract that will not be subject to the whims of Congress next year, and all the rest of us will be free from the Social Security hoax. And then the rest of the proceeds as they come in should be used to pay off the federal debt. Now, nobody knows how much this uh, would bring in. The estimates have ranged anywhere from 5 to $50 trillion that these assets are worth in the, in the marketplace. But consider this. If those assets would bring $12 trillion, it would mean we could liquidate the entire Social Security system without anybody being left holding the bag, and we could pay off the entire nominal federal debt and be through with the interest expense forever. And then we could operate a very strong uh, national defense on $100 billion a year probably. And of course, by national defense, I'm not talking about patrolling the world and policing every uh, conflict that comes up in the world, but rather defending the shores of the United States. We really only need two things to defend this country, a strong missile defense that could uh, repel anybody that wanted to attack this country, and some kind of strong border uh, patrol to protect us from those rampaging Canadians when they come running down from Windsor. <laughs> Sir, you have the honor of the last question, it, but however, it will cost you a $500 donation to Hillsdale. <laughs> now, now, what was the question? Maybe on the point, but how are we going to or can we get a balanced budget? Are we going to or can we get a balanced budget? Um, I don't know if there's any issue today. Well, I suppose there are probably 100 issues today that are more fraudulent than the balanced budget issue, but I, I swear more idiotic, imbecilic things have been uttered about the balanced budget. I remember when the Republicans passed their budget in early 1995, I was watching C-SPAN late at night and seeing all the freshman congressmen after hours on the floor of the House getting up and giving these speeches, congratulating themselves. We have balanced the budget. We have done this. We have done that. All these things that they said they had done, meaning that they had done nothing, but they had made us a promise that some other congressmen, seven years in the future, were going to uh, do spending cuts that they had no guts to do now. Uh, and that those other people would balance the budget. Of course, they had no ability con to control them whatsoever. And then Clinton comes out with his balanced budget in seven years and so on. Then they talk about this balanced budget amendment. And, and I understand the feeling that people have. Yes, we do need this balanced budget. Uh, and so the amendment seems to be the thing. We, it's the only way we'll control the congressman. But the balanced budget amendment is a fraud like everything else. The amendment says that Congress must, at the beginning of the year, uh, pass a budget that is in balance. Well, that's a cinch. All right, we're going to take in next year uh, $2 trillion, and we're going to spend $2 trillion. And you know, at the end of the fiscal year, it turns out they spent $2.2 trillion, and they only took in $1.8 trillion. Oh, whoops. Well, we'll do better next time. Uh, there's no ability to enforce it. What we need is a balanced budget amendment, an amendment that says, number one, 
There shall be no taxes levied by the federal government except on imports and excises. And those taxes will be limited to the following and the following rates and no more. Secondly, every year, Congress is prohibited from appropriating more money than it took in in the previous year. And if Congress runs out of money before the end of the fiscal year, then it is required to shut down the government until the end of the fiscal year. Not shut down the Park Service to make everybody mad. Shut down the government. Now, is that too drastic? Yes. That's the only possible way that they will make sure that they do not run out of money before the end of the year. And that is the only enforceable uh, way that you could have a, make sure that Congress would pass a balanced budget every year. Uh, this is not something that's going to happen in the near future, but after we have a libertarian president and a libertarian Congress, we will get it and we will restore it. But one last point with regard to that. It is not the unbalanced budget that is the problem. It is the size of government. I do not want to see a balanced $2 trillion budget any more than I want to see a balanced $1.6 trillion budget. I, want to, I would be glad to see an unbalanced $100 billion budget, uh, $10 billion in the red. Uh, somehow or other, we'd figure out a way to handle it. Uh, that's the problem, is too much government. And if we have too much government, we have too many laws. And if we have too many laws, we have too many lawsuits and too many lawyers and too much power in the hands of government and too many ways that government can scapegoat it by making us mad at health insurance companies and lawyers and all the people we shouldn't be mad at when what we should be doing is directing our attention to getting the government back to where it belongs, to a limited constitutional size and bind it down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution, as Thomas Jefferson put it. Thank you very, very much for your time.